Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about dispelling personal telescope myths. Uh, these are all the things that you might see that uh, eventually you're going to learn because, you know, math, um, that some of these things that you might have thought of as facts involving telescopes aren't really what you think they are, and that the true math behind it is kind of undeniable. So what myths are we talking about? Uh, first of all, we're going to presume that you already made a decision to buy a telescope. Uh, next week's discussion about uh, dirt cheap telescopes will uh, point out that maybe your first step isn't to buy a telescope. Maybe it's to visit an observatory several times or to maybe buy a pair of binoculars. And then once you realize it's something you want to do, then make a decision as to, uh, you know, what you're going to buy once you learn more. Don't just go right out there, unless, of course, you have several thousand dollars burning a hole in your wallet and you don't mind buying the wrong stuff on your first try. Think of it as um, your initial telescope purchase is going to be something like your first vehicle purchase or your first time big screen TV purchase or for guys pers purchasing a personal stereo system, which is less of a thing nowadays. Um, you'll realize you spent too much or too little on your first choice. And then you went through a number of purchases over time um, that, you know, you had to buy again before you got it to the point where you were comfortable with what you owned um, or you bought something and then had to buy extra parts for it. But I think what you realized is it didn't meet your expectations. So until you learned more about what you were buying, um, you didn't realize that some of those expectations may be market promotion that are more fantasy than reality but you didn't know the difference because you just had a lack of awareness you didn't have the information and uh don't think that the people that want to sell you the wrong stuff are ever going to tell you hey that's the wrong stuff buy this instead of that yeah but that costs less money i know we're going to make less money off of it but you'll be more satisfied if you buy that no no we want you to buy the thousand plus dollar telescope because we make more money that way so the basics of the common myths are bigger is always better. It's not. Heavier is always better. Not necessarily. More expensive is always better. Definitely not. More complex, more complicated is always better. No, it's actually the opposite of that. Um, and you got to work harder to be successful. And you always have to be working harder. It's like, not necessarily. But but the one that's the most egregious myth, I'll actually say lie, is I saw uh, that uh, telescope box that had the pretty picture of the galaxy on it in color, and it was so detailed. So I want to buy that telescope and just look through the eyepiece and see that same pretty picture. No, no, that's just never going to happen. So let's first get rid of the uh, elephant in the room of aperture light buckets as they're called a larger aperture is always better always better you'll find people that will just tell you that and they're just ignoring all the other circumstances as you know things that would say not necessarily so if you have a large aperture you're probably not going to have a long focal length which means you're going to have a low focal ratio a low focal ratio means faster. It's quicker to gather more bright light. The problem is um, it's going to result in a lower, what I refer to as inherent magnification. So if I take a 25 or 26 millimeter focal length eyepiece and I plop it into an F4 uh, Dobsonian, which is a type of Newtonian reflector, uh, and I look at something like Saturn, it's going to look really tiny. But if I put that exact same eyepiece into a much uh, greater focal uh, ratio eyepiece, like an F10 or an F12 or F14, it's going to look larger. How can that be? The diameter is smaller and the length looks shorter. That's because it's a uh, catadioptric reflector and it's got curved lenses and mirrors, which magnifies everything. So there's a couple of things to note about uh, 
Dobsonians and Newtonians is um, they typically require recurring collimation. And we discussed collimation last week. It's got to line up them mirrors before you get a good view. And the more you bounce it around in your car to take it to a site, the more likely it is you're going to have to adjust the collimation. And that uh, Newtonian reflectors are inexpensive, but they're big, they're bulky, and they're difficult to transport. You may find, hey, I just bought myself a, a 10-inch uh, dob, uh, but I've got a uh, compact car. And then you'll find that the length of the tube for the dob doesn't fit in the back seat of your vehicle, and it doesn't fit in the trunk. Hopefully, you got a hatchback where you can fold down the rear seats and get a little more length. So a large aperture from a light polluted site won't let you see dim deep sky fuzzies because all of the light entering the telescope gets collected. So if you think you're going to see something really dim, what you're going to see is something that looks comparatively even dimmer because it's making the background sky look gray, not black. And the cost for that larger aperture is usually offsetting the quality of the go-to in the tracking. Um, there are Dobsonians, Newtonians, that do have go-to, but they're still over $1,000, and they're not really go-to. They're kind of uh, push-to, and then once you get it where you want it, you turn on the clamps, and it will run a motor and track. So it's not really a go-to. And if you talk to a truly experienced deep sky astrophotographer, they use small diameter telescopes with low focal ratios, and they don't put an eyepiece in the back except to line it up. They put a camera in the back. So, you know, they're not going for aperture, and yet they get those lovely pictures of dim deep sky fuzzies. So let's talk field of view. So on the right, I've got the uh, visual here. The underlying picture is of the Orion Nebula, which is about one degree across. This is the angular diameter. And I, I've uh, converted it. Um, I had it in degrees, but I also have it in minutes and seconds, which is fractions of a degree, so that you can compare them all and say, OK, one degree is 3,600 seconds. The sun and the moon are a half a degree in angular diameter. That's half a degree or 30 minutes or 1,800 seconds. Or you, MRO, can I interrupt? Or also you can measure half of the degree. If you stretch your arm, you put your pinky up and you block whatever object you want to see it. So uh, from my point of view, my face is a half of the degree because I'm stretching and covering, as you can see. So the distance of your arm, that doesn't matter how tall you are, and the equivalent, when you stretch your arm and you block your, you use your pinky, you can block the whole moon or the whole sun. Well, that's blocking it without a telescope. I'm talking about if you want to look at an object with a telescope, what size is the angular diameter of the object so you can say, how much field of view do I actually need? Well, you're never going to need more than a degree if you're using your eye. If what you want to look at is typically things like the moon, um, half a degree field of view is plenty. If you're looking at the Orion Nebula from other than a really dark site, you're only going to get about a half a degree of visual observation in there. But if you also want to look at Jupiter and Saturn, they're a tiny fraction of a degree. So whenever you say, I want a giant light bucket that lets me see like five degrees of sky, I'm sorry, there's nothing in the sky that is five degrees that the human eye can see. But about one degree, actually about half a degree is kind of where it tops out. So why would you buy a telescope that's going to gather, you know, two plus degrees of light pollution that's going to make your image look lower contrast? And, you know, what you're going to look at is going to look very tiny. What you should look for is something that gives you a field of view of about a half a degree. And now you're going to start to look at things like the moon will look huge. Orion Nebula will look big and bright. And Jupiter and Saturn won't look like pinpricks. 
whenever you're evaluating the field of view, you have an apparent field of view, which is the um, field of view that the telescope itself gives you. But there's also the actual field of view. And that's where you take the apparent field of view of the eyepiece, and that comes into play to either widen or narrow your field of view. And therefore, it results in the actual field of view. And the telescope doesn't change its field of view. It is what it is. The way you change the field of view is by changing the eyepiece. And the same eyepiece in different telescopes with different field of view will give you different levels of magnification. So now we get into this thing called focal ratio. A longer focal length, that's the length from basically the front of the telescope to where the light comes out to your eye. Um, a longer focal ratio, uh, uh, sorry, a longer focal length increases the focal ratio, which makes it easier for you to visually see things. A larger diameter decreases the focal ratio. So if you're looking for things to be big in your eyepiece, the last thing you want to do is go out and find yourself an F4 telescope. You want something like an F9 or greater. Now, if you're doing long duration exposure with a camera, then you're probably going to be looking for something that's less than F5 because you want to gather more light quickly. A lower fo focal ratio will give you a wider field of view. Higher will give you a narrow field of view. You don't need considerably more field of view than the angular size of your intended target in degrees. And if mostly what you're going to be looking at is the moon and the planets, half a degree is plenty. Excessive field of view will, uh, or a lower focal ratio gives you uh, less perceived magnification and includes more background sky illumination. So lower contrast, the background sky will look gray, not actually black. To make it look bigger, get a telescope with a lower focal ratio. Uh, and, you know, if you have a lower focal ratio telescope and you want things to look bigger, you're going to be spending a lot more money on eyepieces. You'll learn to understand $300. What kind of eyepiece is that? It's called a Nagler. And then for the non-believers that aperture isn't where it's at, you might ask them, okay, when you bought your telescope and you got the front cover for your telescope, did it have little holes in it with cover, you know, like little cups to cover the caps to cover them? Yeah. What do you think that's for? Well, if I want to increase the magnification of what I'm looking at, I can either go buy more expensive eyepieces or I can reduce the aperture of my telescope. Basically, make it smaller. The focal length stays the same. The aperture, the diameter gets smaller. Therefore, the focal ratio gets higher. And now I can, with the same eyepiece, get more magnification. So there's a counterintuitive to the myth. Like, So if I buy a certain diameter telescope and I want to get more magnification out of it, I have to actually reduce the diameter of my telescope. Yep. And if I buy a reflector, I get two holes. Well, at least one hole or typically two holes. And they're offset. They're not in the center. Don't I want all the good light coming in from the center? No, because you bought a reflector and in the center is a secondary mirror that's blocking out the light coming in from the front. So that's where the hole's off to one side. It's called an off-axis uh, stop. But if you have a refractor, there's no secondary in the way. So the off the off axis won't be off axis. It'll be in the dead center, which is the part of the uh, refractor that is the sweet spot, and you have no distortions at the edge of the lenses. If you realize that you have to give up your diameter to get a better view, does that connect any dots for you? Like larger is not always better, and that secondary mirror obstruction is a real thing. So now let's talk about mounts. Everybody goes and looks at a mountain. They want something that looks like, uh, I don't know, Jules Verne designed it. It's got to have lots of gears and knobs and weights, and and that's a good mount, right? Uh, that one in the upper right isn't. That's going to be a very shaky mount. 
and more expensive than the one at the bottom. The one at the bottom there is an altitude azimuth mount. The reason why you want a polar or equatorial mount like the one at the top is if you're doing long duration exposure imaging. And that's because the Earth is tilted on its axis. And therefore, if you want to run only one gear, one axis to track things across the sky, you get an equatorial mount. But there are things in the sky that don't move that way, like asteroids, comets, satellites. If you want to observe those things, might as well get an altitude azimuth mount because an equatorial mount won't be able to track those kind of things. So why would you get an equatorial? Well, the way that the telescope moves across the sky, if it happens to be equatorial, it moves it linearly across the sky. The image doesn't rotate as the target moves across the sky. But if it's an altitude azimuth, think of it as you're going to be moving your hand across the sky. See how my hand turns? Well, your camera is going to rotate as well as it moves across the sky. And therefore, if it turns too fast, your objects are going to smear. So if you're doing deep sky long duration exposures, go for the equatorial mount. If you just plop on the telescope down, you put an eyepiece in it, you want to look, altitude azimuth is fine and it's easier to set up and actually cost less. And if you get one that's a little more sophisticated that has, let's say, a, a GPS or a GNNS receiver and an electronic level, then it makes it even easier to set up. So what about magnification? The fill the eyepiece fantasy. I don't know how many times I've heard, heard that at the observatory where it's small. Is there any way you can put an eyepiece in there where we're like, fill the field of view? I, I, I want like Neptune to fill the entire eyepiece. Right? And you're living in South Florida, humidity, temperature, you're never going to get enough magnification so that it doesn't look like a, a ghost of a planet that's just like swimmy. So there is a real uh, ambient environment limit as to how much magnification you should be doing to whatever you're looking at. And the way you judge magnification is simply by eyepiece focal length divided by telescope focal length. Notice telescope aperture or diameter is not even a part of the math. So if you're only looking for magnification, aperture is not the way to get magnification. Focal length is the way to get magnification. If you have a shorter focal length telescope and you want to get more magnification, then you have to get an eyepiece with a shorter focal length, which costs more. The aperture, the pupil, the, the aperture you're looking through in the eyepiece is going to be smaller diameter. Um, but if you want it to be bigger, then you're going to pay a lot more for the eyepieces. And you'll, you'll learn what the price tag of a Nagler is. So less magnification. You have a brighter, more stable view, a darker background, higher contrast, a better observing experience. So here's an example. Here's the moon and the moon. So um, if I take a 25 millimeter eyepiece and I put it into a telescope that has uh, F12, like a Maxutov Cassegrain reflector, 150 millimeter. Um, I'm going to get 72 times magnification. That's the big image at the top. If I put that into an F5 Newtonian reflector, a daub, and I, I have a 10 inch daub, you know, it's, it's almost twice the diameter of that, you know, 5.9 inch uh, Maxutov reflector. Uh, I'm only going to get 50 times magnification. So I'm paying for a bigger telescope and getting a 30% redu reduction in magnification for the same size eyepiece. As the saying goes, the math doesn't lie. But what about resolving power? Uh, surely you need a larger diameter telescope to split those stars or to see the fine detail. Well, here's, here's the other formula for you. Um, if you want to calculate something called the resolving power of a telescope. People get it confused with the Dawes limit. But uh, it's basically, if I have two objects and I want to split them apart, so I see it as two things, not one thing smooshed together, then I need to bring in more light to give me more edge 
It's not for the magnification. It's to get more light in so I can resolve more detail. But how much do you need? Here's the formula. Um, R in arc seconds is 134, and that's based upon uh, the wavelength of yellow light, divided by the D, which is the aperture or diameter in millimeters. So if I want to calculate R, I can do so if I've got a uh, telescope that is three and a half inches in diameter. I can get 1.49 arc seconds of resolving power, which, okay, that's, that's a number. If I have a bigger diameter telescope, like a 5.9 inch Maksutov Cassegrain, I can get 0.89 arc seconds. Now a smaller number here means more resolving power. Or I can have my 10 inch telescope and I can get a half an arc second resolving power. Well, what am I going to do with that? What is it that I need a half a half an arc second resolving power to see? So you'll, you'll recognize here there's some popular double stars. Polaris is the double star. What do I need to split or note that Polaris is really two stars, not one star? I need 83 arc seconds. That's not a fraction of an arc second. That's, you know, 8 times 10 arc seconds. So even a 3.5 inch telescope is going to give me enough resolving power to split Polaris. Or Mizar, or Alberio, or Rigel. I can even see the Cassini division in the rings of Saturn as a black line with only 3.5 arc seconds of resolving power and my three and a half inch diameter telescope is better than that. It's at 1.49 arc seconds. Remember, a smaller number is more resolving power. So I can resolve any of that stuff in that list with a three and a half inch telescope. Now, note in the formula that nowhere in there is the focal length of the telescope. It's purely the diameter, purely the light gathering ability of the telescope. So magnification and resolving power are not directly connected mathematically in the world of optical calculations. You have magnification and you have resolving power. But if you're bringing in enough light to resolve whatever you want to resolve, now you can put more magnification on it by having a higher, fo a higher uh, focal ratio, a longer focal length. So that's why you can have a three and a half inch telescope that can show you a magnified image of Saturn, complete with seeing the black line of the Cassini division in the rings. Where you're going to run out of steam is because of the steam, the heat and humidity. You can only magnify up to a certain limit where I don't care what your resolving power is, humidity is saying you're not getting there. The, the other thing that you can say about resolving power is that when you compare the smaller telescopes that we put in space and the larger telescopes we put in space, when you see the pictures, you can see the fine details and a little bit of the uh, uh, the gases. You can see more details when you have more uh, a larger telescope. So you can see like very fine details where uh, you know globules are forming stars. That so th that's more like for professional telescopes, that's very important for having a uh, resolving power. But those, but tel those telescopes, see? those telescopes they put in space, there are no human eyeballs on an eyepiece. Yeah, yeah. So as you're saying, uh, for for you know, resolving power for uh, backyard telescopes. Only if you're doing astrophotography, that's ex right. ex it's very important. And if it's visual, you know, maybe a pair of binoculars or, uh, you know, a three, a three inch telescope, it, it will be, it would suffice for whatever you're looking just for observing. Right. right. That's the idea is it's not that bigger isn't better. It's how much bigger do you need 
for what you want to do. Now let's talk about cameras. Cameras, also known as imagers, they're designed to do astro imaging or take pictures of astronomical things. Um, a camera like that is going to typically be purpose built. Um, it's built for the purpose of taking astro imaging, and it's a. It'll either be inexpensive for a reason, or it'll be very expensive for a reason. If it's inexpensive for a reason, it's probably going to be a planetary or lunar camera. And given the um, the light gathering ability of CMOS inexpensive chips, like are used in your mobile phone five years ago, those are inexpensive cameras. If you want a charge couple device or a CCD that gives you really long duration exposure and it has, let's say, electronic cooling on it to reduce the electronic noise, now you're talking over a thousand dollars, probably a couple of thousand dollars for a good camera. And uh, it's probably not going to be color. It's probably going to be black and white and you have to put multiple filters on it to get the best possible image. And you don't just do a one shot and take one picture. You actually take a stack of images and then you, you know, you might have spent five hours getting the images and then you're going to go spend five hours post processing the images to get that one JPEG, you know, picture result. You, if you want a high quality imaging capable camera, it starts with the camera and then it works out through the telescope and everything just gets more expensive. There is no dollar amount to be paid for, you know, drop dead simple one shot color that it's just impractical and now we talk about well what, what about the picture itself um don't i want just more and more pixels well mm, you want to balance that out you want how much light are you gathering with those pixels how is the data converted because the light comes in as photons the photons hit silicon material and get converted into electrons they get stored as a charge, and then the charge gets read out, and that tells the software um, basically the brightness of that pixel. Now, if you have a one-shot color camera, then some of those pixels are going to have color filters on the front of them. You're just not going to notice it. It's called a Bayer matrix, and that's how you get one-shot color. But for the people that are taking uh, serious astrophotography, they'll always be doing monochrome, uh, grayscale. And, you know, if, if you're used to color that's eight bits per pixel, um, that's your typical 16 million color one shot camera. But if you're shooting in grayscale and you've got a 12 bit per pixel and you do three different uh, color filters like red, green, uh, sorry, four different colors of filters red green blue and luminance which is no filter for brightness measurement and you've got 4096 levels per pixel the detail in that image is going to be far better than your 8-bit uh you know mobile phone camera and if you have a wider field of view and you have a certain number of pixels those pixels are going to be spread over the entire field of view and if what you want to see is very small and not very much magnified um, you're, you're basically going to be taking a picture of the entire Eagle Nebula in order to get a picture of the pillars of creation. And it's going to be about 60 pixels across out of your five megapixel camera. If, if you can spread your pixels over a smaller amount of sky, you're going to get better resolution in your image. So what about buying a packaged camera? You know, one, one where you don't have to worry about all of it. You're going to buy a thing that's got the, the camera and the telescope and the mount all together, and it comes from a single manufacturer. I, I bought an Orion or a Celestron or a Mead or an Astrophysics or whatever, and I bought it all from the same manufacturer. Well, all that means is only one company got your revenue. But what you'd rather be doing is buying components from whatever gives you the best bang for the buck. So make sure that they'll play together, play nice with other parts. So if you want eyepieces, you'll either want inch and a quarter or two inch eyepieces. And it's really comical to see that 
uh, an eyepiece that might cost better than three hundred dollars the part that fits into the two inch gives you more than an inch and a quarter where your eye is but the light coming in at the back end has an inch and a quarter stop on it even though it's in a two inch receiver it's just funny to look at that i i paid extra for this two inch eyepiece that's actually only taking in light that's an inch and a quarter across when you buy a mount, you want one that can support standardized brackets for attaching telescopes. So for the smaller, lighter weight telescopes, you want a Vixen. And for the larger, heavier telescopes, you want a Los Mandy. Those are called dovetail brackets. And you can do the same thing with the, the finders. If you have a finder that is a proprietary bracket, it's, it's hard to correct for that or to get a replacement from somebody else. Uh, it's better to get uh, a Vixen style uh, finder bracket so you can just go get any finder and plop in there. If you're going to get a camera that isn't already pre set up for an inch and a quarter or a two inch eyepiece, get one that has a removable nose piece where the lens is that is either M12, yes, that's metric, or has a camera size uh, screw on adapter, which is either C or CS. The difference between C and CS is not the diameter or the thread. It's basically the back focus length of the, uh, the eyepiece. When you're getting a camera, they can come either as USB serial or RJ45 wired ethernet connections. Don't go for something that's parallel or uses proprietary DIN cables uh, because if it's only built to work with that kind of interface, what if you want a different telescope or you want a different mount or you want a different uh, camera? Uh, they don't play together. So go for something that's based upon uh, something that's a recognized standard. And if, you're, if you want to power your mount, um, the standard connector is a 5.5 by 2.1 millimeter barrel style plug to jack for 12 volts. They're not DIN cables, they're not screw-on cables, they're not uh, like um, automobile connectors, they, they're not cigarette lighter plugs, they're barrel jacks and plugs. And now we get to the, yeah, but the price on that package deal is so good, um, but it comes with a cheap telescope. Well, maybe you're gonna buy the package for the tripod and the mount and the telescope. Yeah, it's kind of a throwaway. It's a, a cheap plastic tube uh, refractor that's only got a doublet lens in it. So you may find that the total package price is such that it's better to just buy the packaged mount and tripod and then buy the telescope separately, take the disposable refractor off of there, put the better telescope on there because it supports a Vixen style dovetail. What about accessories? Don't I have to buy my battery from the same company I bought my telescope from? No. You don't have to buy a Dynamo Pro or a power tank in order to power your mount. You can actually just go buy a 12 volt car charger kind of a lithium battery. And that will last you for, oh, roughly three years. And then you have to go buy another one. So don't spend a lot of money on them. Um, get it with the right plug for your mount. That's the 5.1 by 2.5 barrel jack and plug. There's no requirement for you to run AC power in the field unless you, you know, you want to run your laptop on AC power, but even laptops, you can get a DC power adapter for them. Don't spend a lot of money on kits of eyepieces with a bunch of eyepieces that you only use two out of there and the rest of them you'll never use or a bunch of filters that you know you're going to buy 20 filters and use three of them on a regular basis anytime something is a collection of accessories and it comes in a lovely box or a, a suitcase looking enclosure um, a good piece of the total price you're paying is for that packaging batteries and electronics Volts is volts, amps is amps, and duration is watts. So when you, when you want to buy something to power your, your telescope mount, 
commonly 12 volts. AC power or mains power in the US is 120 volts AC, 60 hertz. But your telescope doesn't run on AC, your telescope runs on DC. So if you bought a telescope, it likely came with a power adapter that takes mains power and converts it to 12 volts DC. When you buy a, a power source, they can have all sorts of uh, certifications and you want to get something that you know won't short circuit, won't burn itself up, is protected so it won't fry you and all those kind of things. But there's no need to buy something that's going to run your telescope mount for three days. If you can run your telescope mount for four hours, that's plenty. You can actually look at the rating on your telescope to find out how much power it consumes per hour and then buy a battery that has that many amp hours. You don't need to buy more than that. So you can buy an inexpensive car jumpstart battery like the one in the picture here. It's just a generic brand, um, but they all look pretty much the same. You won't need the battery cables because telescope doesn't need those, but it's got that little blue plug that is called an EC5 plug. And then you can buy an adapter that you can plug in an EC5 into that and it'll come out as a cigarette lighter. And you can probably get a 12 volt cigarette lighter adapter for your mount. If you wanna buy a big battery, you can do that. But if you buy one that does not have thermal management as part of the electronics of the battery, start the clock. That battery is going to be good for about three years because when you're not using the battery, most people will just leave it on the charger. Um, if you're not using a lithium iron phosphate battery and you don't have thermal management, start the clock. You're going to be throwing that battery away no matter how much it costs you in about three years. And we saved the most egregious lie or myth for the last. Um, there are three pictures there at the bottom. There is the Andromeda galaxy as it appears on the outside of the box of uh, a package telescope, or it appears on their website, or on a promotional page by some reviewer. Look, you can take this kind of picture with that telescope. Oh, we left out how much you're going to spend on the camera, the accessories to adapt the camera, how much you're going to spend on the post-processing software, the fact that you're going to take stacks of images out in the Everglades with the mosquitoes and the, the heat and the humidity for five hours, and then go process the image for five hours to get that picture. And you're not actually getting that picture. It'll likely be a crappier picture than that. And you'll replace the color palette with the Hubble Space Telescope color palette. And then you'll touch up a few distortions in the image. And that's how you get that. But when they go to sell you a telescope, the only way they're going to entice you to buy it is they're going to put that picture on the box. The next picture over is what you're going to actually look in the eyepiece and see as the Andromeda galaxy on a reasonable sky. If it's a light polluted city sky, it'll look grayer and Andromeda will look smaller. Now, what about those guys that are taking pictures? Well, if they're taking pictures from urban or suburban areas, they're probably not taking color pictures. They're probably taking black and white gray pictures, RGB, or even better yet, they go for hydrogen alpha narrow band, which to the human eye looks like a very dark red. And then they transform that into color by mapping the brightness levels into the Hubble palette of colors. And then instead of seeing the picture on the right, you'll see the picture on the left again. But you'll never see that with the human eye. So whenever you see a pretty picture on the outside of a box or on a website or on a review page, ask yourself, is that what I'm going to see with my eye? Or will that be a camera with lots of software and lots of processing effort? If it's the picture on the left, yeah, you're not going to see that with your eye. If it's the picture in the middle, that's real. That's what you're going to see. Maybe even worse than that, but it's in the ballpark. So in conclusion, don't be drawn in by aperture size or deep sky pictures on product packages. A light bucket is not your best choice for observing uh, with human eyes from light polluted cities. Buy what you need 
and not what's been prepackaged for you. Do look to buy components separately from different manufacturers or sellers to get your best capability for the best price. Don't buy bulk accessory packages of eyepieces or filters with parts that you'll never use. Do buy an appropriate power source. Um, probably not AC. DC will last you longer because if you start with AC and your, your telescope runs on DC, the first thing you're going to be doing is throwing a good 10% of your AC power away by converting it to DC with an inverter. A narrow field of view plus a CMOS camera with an abundant level of pixels gives you a detailed image, but not, might not be a bright one. Um, there's absolutely no such thing as a single telescope with a single camera that's useful for visual observing that also is a point and shoot color astrophotography camera for all types of celestial targets. No matter how many thousands you spend, no matter how large an aperture, point and shoot is it's not the terminology you should be looking for. So I was going to look for some links of other people dispelling telescope myths. And I looked in a lot of the forums. And even the people that are on the forums that are supposedly serious amateur astronomers, all of them exhibited one or more of those myths. Oh, your first telescope should be a daub. And the more money you can buy for the bigger diameter, the better. Never did they ask the question, Will you be observing from a light polluted city? No, just go buy a big dub. You, you'll be happy. No. Or um, you want or to have a small car, or you cannot carry weight. Yeah, yeah. Or you're somebody that can't lift a telescope that weighs 75 pounds. It's just too much. You have to have two people lift it for you. So, well, whenever I had to lift the 10 inch dub at Fox, yeah. I always imagine myself drop, drop the tube and the tube rolling down the mound. And, and just like a cartoon. Whenever I talk, I, I, I hold that telescope. We, we, I, we actually, I had to separate. So I first moved the mound and then the, the telescope. But whenever I did that, I just imagined the whole thing just rolling down the mound. Um, we actually did have that happen to the old 12 inch Newtonian. <laughs> um, it was out on its mount, and we were in a hurry to bring it in. And there was a wind or rainstorm or something coming. And it got off the mount. It got squirrely. And it rolled down the back of the embankment at, at, at the observatory. So, yeah, yeah. That kind of thing does happen when you have more weight than you need. You have a bigger light bucket than you need. You're looking at a huge amount of sky for something that's very tiny. So I heard I heard an, I heard another story that someone was cleaning a, a mirror and the mirror rolled down the mount too. Uh, that was actually Herbie. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was too heavy. I was just expecting to drop the whole thing, and it's like, no, no, I'm not. Well, doing the, that. the the mirror in the 13 inch um, blue daub Tardis, um, the mirror itself was about 35 pounds. Yeah, I could not that was that, that was a mirror from the early 1970s technology. There was no honeycomb, lightweight, you know, fused glass, none of that stuff. That was a chunk of glass. Yes, I could not. But yeah. I, I was glad that most of the the larger telescope they had there when I used to teach the Girl Scouts, yep. they all have uh, dollies, Dolly. so I can yeah, so they I can dollies so the can roll them around. Yeah. yeah. But you have like the, the the air conditioner trap barrier on the door, so it was a little bump. The, that the you weather did stripping, that. yeah. Yeah, and, the weather stripping. And you had to grab so, the rope on them and pull up, not out. Yeah. yeah. So whenever we we did that, we lost the collimation. So it yeah. was a nightmare. Well, you you've seen the tripod dolly that I created out of giant. Uh, foam-filled rubber wheels from Northern Tool. Um, I've taken that thing through all sorts of rough grass and no problem there. But the beach sand on Miami Beach, no, nah, I'd never make it through that. So 
lighter, you know, a smaller, not a light bucket, but a, something that's reasonably small for what you want to look at with the human eye is lightweight. You know, it, it's something that you're easily going to be able to lift. And it's yes. inexpensive. And it'll give you more magnification. And it'll give you a darker background sky. So yeah. yeah. So it's like even in, in the case of binoculars, if you're not going like, especially in my opinion, your first instrument should be a binocular because it is lighter, it's not expensive. You can give to your kids so they can learn, enjoy, be the first step and give you time to understand and see other people's equipment and decide if you're gonna do just, just observing, if you're gonna do outreach. If you're gonna do uh, astrophotography planetary or astrophotography uh, uh, deep sky, so there are many areas of uh, astronomy that they are so diverse. And as you said, for each kind of astronomy you're gonna do, you need a different kind of equipment. So you need time to learn and just figure out what you want to do and how much money you have to burn in the in the hobby. So. My opinion is the first instrument should be a pair of binoculars. It, and don't go big because I made a, a mistake to give as a gift for my mom a 75 millimeter uh, pair of binoculars. Too heavy. It is too heavy for her. I actually had to buy a, 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 almost like a backpack kind of a, a, a strap for the binoculars it made of silicone. So it was on her back and it doesn't hurt. And then because I learned that, I bought a 50 millimeter for myself because then I know that the thing is lighter, it's easy to move around, and it was about same price too. And this time of the year, that's the best time to look for. Mine, a uh, pair of binoculars of Nikons, if you look around this time of the year, you're probably going to find some kind of a discount uh, of sale. Uh, and if you, it, you need to be a maritime kind of a pair of binoculars that has uh, the inside of the, the binoculars are closed. So it's like sometimes they put argon, sometimes they put nitrogen, so it doesn't get foggy. If you get a pair of binoculars like this, and if as a plus, you get a pair of binoculars that had the hole in the center, then you can put an L and put in a tripod. You set it to you know put stuff in your backpack, go to very dark places and enjoy the sky better than the telescope. Because I take half hour to set up my telescope. And a pair of binoculars, you just remove all of your backpack and you're good to go. I take it one notch less than that, which is your best first telescope is one that you didn't buy. In other words, go to an observatory, use theirs. They've spent a lot of money on their telescope. They know how to operate it properly. They put in the right eyepiece, uh, as we were known for making Saturn look like a sticker. <laughs> um, that's what you want to do, because you might have to pay a membership fee or an admission fee, but that is the cheapest way you can get the best possible view, is have somebody else buy the telescope. If you want to buy a pair of binoculars, look at what um, Celestron offers. They call them um, Cometrons. Um, they're only seven by 35. They're 35 di millimeter diameter. Um, they're seven times magnification. Sure, they're not going to zoom things way up, but they have all the, the functionality and they're well less than $100 regular price. So they're going to be nitrogen purged. They're going to have the little receiver. So if you want to put them on a tripod, you can. They're going to have the diopter adjustment. So you can uh, basically, because no human eyes are going to be the same, both eyes. You can have different, you know, um, you know, 10, 20, 20, 20. You're going to have differences between your two eyes. So what you want to do is take your good eye, get the adjustment in on the length, and then close that eye, open the other eye, and then you adjust the um, uh, magnification on that eye, and then you change the diopter between the eyes to fit you. And now you can see things. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen people grab a pair of binoculars, they smack them up to their face and go, I can't see anything. Okay, did you, how much, what did you adjust on there? Do I have to adjust? You know, first of all, there's the zoom. So they'll do the zoom and they go, well, it looks fuzzy. Okay, close one eye. Well, it looks sharp there, but the other eye looks fuzzy. Okay, adjust the other eye. Hey, that looks much better. 
but I, it doesn't look all that bright. Okay, take the tele, take the binoculars and bend them like this. And if you can bend them like this, so that they sink more into your head, more into your skull, now you're excluding all the outside light, mm -hmm. and you can see better. But when you do that, you're going to have to adjust the focus again because your eyeballs aren't parfocal. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so that, that is a uh, cheaper equipment that you can buy. And yep. then if you're really jonesing for a telescope to say, oh, I have a telescope, uh, from the experience that I have for my own telescope, this is a, 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 Max, oh, is a Schmidt Cassegrain. And from all the telescopes that I've, I use for other people, I think the best first telescope is the tabletop telescope that is a maxotop yep, Cassegrain. Yep, that yep. one is such an easier telescope to use for anyone. It's a little bit more expensive than a pair of binoculars. It's like, what, $400? No, $300. Uh, no, Orion, Orion has them MSRP at about $350 but you can typically get them for 330. Um, but it's it's a tabletop. It has a little hole in the bottom. So if you want to put it on a camera tripod, you can. Obviously it's not go-to, there's no camera. It's just a telescope, a couple of eyepieces and a finder. You can sit so it, on, ready table. To use you can fit it on the hood of your car. Um, you know, it's yeah. very easy. Yeah, some telescopes that you buy, they come they don't come with eyepieces. So you have to buy the telescope and then buy the eyepieces. That one that Monroe just mentioned, yep. it comes with two eyepieces, comes with the finder, and is ready to use out of the box. Yep. If, if, if probably even comes with the battery for the finder. So it's such a yep. good first telescope. That is, like, in my opinion, from what the experience that yep. I have using them. Yeah. Now, the, if you can expend a little bit more money, uh, a refractor telescopes are very expensive because the glass is more expensive to produce than uh, uh, than uh, than a, a mirror telescope. And but you know, for first instruments, if you're gonna give that instrument to a ten years old, eight years old, get a pair of binoculars and a tripod for that binoculars, you're good to go. Yeah, if, if you get a small Maxutov Cassegrain that has a very high focal ratio, it'll be good visually. But if you get one that has a Vixen style dovetail plate to mount it to the tabletop, um, if you want to get a go-to computerized tracking, whatever, you can basically dismount the telescope from the tabletop stand, mount it on the mount. You didn't waste your telescope. You're using the same telescope. So if you like the view, but you want to see where things are in the sky without having to know them, you just want to go to Jupiter kind of thing once you set it up, um, it'll do that and it'll track. So, you know, don't have to buy everything packaged all at once and you don't have to throw away everything when you upgrade. Always buy things that are compatible and you can keep parts. You won't have to throw it all away. And the other detail of the mountain top telescope. Can you go back to the picture? You have the picture there. Yeah, that one. Well, so, here's the telescope on the tabletop with a tripod underneath it. So that's the, the advantage of that specific tabletop is that that is the screw on the bottom that you can put a, a, a on a tripod. So a telescope like that, you can place on your backpack and you, you can bring to a dark place and it has a good interest magnification. It comes already with two eyepieces. That one is like, after the pair of binoculars, that one would be like my favorite to indicate to someone who right now is looking for a telescope to give as for Christmas or to buy for Christmas. Now, this one, putting a setup like this, almost $400, right, Monroe? With a, yeah, a good tripod, and it needs to be a good tripod because it's flimsy. Uh, tripod don't work. For well, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. This actually has the tabletop on top of a camera style tripod. That's not the yeah. one that I would. No, that's not the one I'd recommend. Um, but what I'd actually recommend doing is get yourself something like this for the for the uh, tripod and the mount. And then take that telescope off of there or buy it without that telescope and then put the tabletop telescope 
off of the tabletop mount into the Vixen dovetail plate. So you'll have this telescope on this mount. So what, what you have there in the picture he's describing is you get the telescope from the tabletop, the one on the bottom. You remove the refractor from the top and use the tripod or the, the tripod from the, the black one and you use the red one. So yeah. this is would be something like that. And if you look on eBay or Craigslist, you're going to find like a really good, uh, you know, uh, a tripod for a simple telescope. So yeah, like Monroe said, the first one is the one that someone gives to you, or you you or you use someone's telescope to learn a little bit more. Now, if you're looking for buying, but I do not advise if you're gonna give a kid who is like just ten years old that he's gonna drop stuff or he's just gonna leave outside and like that. And, you, you know, you give something that's $400 for a kid to destroy, it's a little bit expensive to be the first telescope, if, especially if you don't know how they're going to use the instrument. If, the if total... you give a pair of binoculars, they're like less than $100 if you buy a good one. And uh, it's like they can observe not just uh, the sky at night, but they can see at birds. Now, the only thing that I advise to you is to be very firm. If you're going to give a pair of binoculars to a kid or even a telescope to a kid, you got to be very firm to say, never point to the sun because you can blind someone. You can burn the retina looking at the sun, even for a fraction of a second. It's very serious. So we are talking about here preparing to buy stuff to give to someone. Uh, during Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever, you know, commemoration you're doing at the end of the year. If you want to give someone an a instrument that you can see stuff in the sky, first one is a pair of binoculars with the screw in the middle so you can put a, a you adapter to a tripod. Other than that, if you're going to give a, a telescope, you can put in a tripod, a simple telescope, you will not find a decent telescope that's less than $300. And so if you go on a, and any big box stores, I don't want to name which brands, you know. So if you go there and see a, like a big box and it's showing the telescope, those they're sold in the supermarket or in the mall, those are very expensive toy. You're going to pay $200 for something that when you put your face and you try to observe whatever you're trying to observe, the whole telescope is going to move and it's going to be frustrating and the kids will never want to see again. So instead to be burning like the to. <laughs> so if you're going to buy something to a kid uh, that's very expensive, more than three, uh, it, it needs to be more than $300 or you're going to buy a very expensive toy that will not work, that will not be able to set up, and is going to be in your garage gathering dust, and it will first take your kid, and you, you run in a risk for them to never even like science. So tonight where we're just going to discuss uh, the myths involving telescopes, next week's presentation will get into detail as to what to buy and what not to buy and what features to look for. Um, Tonight was just like, you know, if you think you want, you want to fill the eyepiece fantasy of magnification, how that myth actually plays out in reality. Uh, so that's what we're doing this week. Next week, we'll actually discuss um, the purchasing process, how, how to buy something. Yeah. So can you, when you do your presentation, kind of give an idea, prices and kind of advise which ages you know stuff that's too expensive should not be going yeah. to the hands of young children 